Hi, I'm Mike DeSocio. I'm an independent journalist and author of the book Morally Straight, How the Fight for LGBTQ Inclusion Changed the Boy Scouts in America. And you're listening to Troy Story, a podcast for the Collar City. Hello, and welcome back to Troy Story, a podcast for the Collar City, where we explore the history and people of Troy, New York, one conversation at a time. I'm your host, John Salka. June is Pride Month, an annual celebration of the LGBTQ plus community and their decades-long struggle and hard-fought victories to exist with equal rights and protections under the law. From Stonewall to marriage equality and the ongoing work to preserve those rights, there are countless stories that have come to define Pride through the preceding 50 years. Today's episode focuses on an often forgotten part of the American LGBTQ plus history, expertly told by Mike DeSocio, Troy-based independent journalist, podcaster, and author of the new book, Morally Straight, How the Fight for LGBTQ Inclusion Changed the Boy Scouts and America, which documents the fight to end a decades-long ban on gay people from the then Boy Scouts of America. Mike walks us through the long and complicated history of discrimination against gay people within the BSA, the key players involved with the fight to end the gay membership policy, and how the U.S. Supreme Court shaped the trajectory of the debate over LGBTQ participation in scouting. We also share stories about our own scouting experience, something we get deeper into during part two. This was a great discussion with someone who I consider an expert on this important part of American LGBTQ history. Very excited to finally share this chat with Mike, whose book is available now. So, whether you're a history buff, a current or former scout, or just someone looking to learn more about the struggle for LGBTQ inclusion and visibility, then I think you will enjoy this book and this episode. Before we jump into the interview, just a quick thank you for the continued support for the show. After just six guests, we are on the cusp of cracking 2,500 downloads. We have some very cool episodes planned for July and August on topics close to my heart, and I'm eager to get the interviews wrapped up soon. Don't forget to hit subscribe on your favorite podcast service so you don't miss a single chapter. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts right now, please leave a review and let us know what you think of the episode. Our growing list of previous chapters is available on TroyStoryPod.com. That's where you can find a link to sign up for email updates. We promise not to spam your inbox. Only the best stuff from your favorite local history podcast. Now, without further ado, here's part one of our conversation with author and Eagle Scout, Mike DeSocio. I am really, really uh, excited to have our next guest on the show, Mike DeSocio. He is here to discuss his excellent new book, Morally Straight, How the Fight for LGBTQ Inclusion Changed the Boy Scouts and America. Mike Thank you so much for uh, agreeing to be on the show. You are our sixth ever guest on the show. So that's pretty exciting. Yeah, thanks, John. It's a pleasure and honor to be here. Let's just jump right into it. Uh, just explain uh, what this book is about, what was behind the book, and why you decided to write it. Yeah, so I grew up in scouting. I'm an Eagle Scout, and I was involved since the age of five as a Cub Scout. And I managed to go through most of the program without ever knowing that there was a policy about gay people. And... From the moment that I discovered there was, I always had a curiosity about why that policy existed, where it came from, what the history of it was. At first, it was a, a personal curiosity because I was coming to terms with myself as a queer person, but eventually it became a journalistic curiosity as well. And I had written about it here and there over the years through high school and then college and then professionally. And a uh, in 2019, I was sitting down with a friend having tea one afternoon, and he encouraged me to think about writing a book. And this just immediately felt like the thing I would write a book about. So I could really finally understand that history fully. So that's what the book does. It takes us back to the 1970s when the anti-gay policy was created in the Boy Scouts of America. And it tells the full history of the battles and campaigns for reversing that policy, for gaining LGBTQ inclusion in the Boy Scouts. So this is a story of scouters, Eagle Scouts, parents, just everyday people who discovered that the Boy Scouts were discriminating and decided that they wanted to fight back against that. 
So when I was reading the book, uh, for for background for listeners, I am also an Eagle Scout, and this is why I've why I alluded to why I was so excited to have this conversation because I too came up through the scouting program, uh, Tiger Cubs when I was in kindergarten, all the way up through the Cub Scouts, Arrow of Light, Boy Scouts, Eagle Scout, uh, uh, just shortly before I turned eighteen. So when I saw Mike that you were writing this book, I was really excited, and I reached out to you right away. I was like, "This sounds super exciting. I really, I really." Mm-hmm. It. First, I just wanted to say the book stirred up for me a lot of great memories about scouting. Mm. Um, and it also reminded me of the universal experience of scouting. Uh, that's something that's shared across all backgrounds, uh, sexual orientations, but also generations. I mean, mm-hmm. you mentioned it specifically starting in the 70s. Uh, some of the stories that were told, and I just found myself going, like, oh, my God, that was exactly how scouting yeah. worked. For me, when I, in the '90s, you know, which was yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that was one of the cool things for me too. As the journalist here, like every time I interviewed someone, I was really delighted to find that we had so much shared experience. And I look up upon my experience in scouting really fondly. I mean, I wrote a book that is at times very critical of the organization, but I would not have stayed in the program for twenty plus years, you know, including time as an adult volunteer if I didn't really care about it and still do really care about it. So yeah, those experiences were some of the best of my childhood. And I think that's a theme that's emphasized throughout the entire book with all the different scouts, um, Eagle Scouts, uh, adult leaders, those who were kicked out of the program for being Mm -hmm. being queer, um, that and, and specifically the organization Scouts for Equality, which I think is is sort of like the tent pole or the line that runs through the whole book. They are not there to um, break scouting up or change what scouting is. They're simply saying, we, we love scouting. We just want scouting to be more inclusive of everyone. Can you sort of talk a little bit about or explain what, mm. what Scouts for Equality was, explain what that group did? Yeah, that's such a good point that you bring up. These were people, insiders, really, who were so dedicated to making the organization a better place. So Scouts for Equality emerged in 2012 as the final wave of activism, essentially, that ended up changing these policies. So there had been many attempts at this before. There was a case that went to the Supreme Court that I'm sure we'll talk about. But in 2011, 2012, it all kind of reemerged after a lesbian dead mother named Jennifer Terrell uh, was kicked out of her son's Cub Scout pack in Ohio. She was really beloved. She was openly gay for her entire time in that role. And then all of a sudden, one day, she was kicked out for being gay. And her son was devastated, and the whole pack was. And this story really captured media attention at the time. And very quickly, uh, through kind of a chance encounter with another Eagle Scout, there was a desire to leverage that attention and that outrage to create Scouts for Equality. So this was a a nonprofit, essentially, that was led by Scouts and Scouters, mostly straight men, actually, mostly allies, essentially. There was only one gay person in, like, the core team of Scouts for Equality, which I think is, is sort of funny. And they led what was basically a media campaign for for a few years where they really intensely gathered stories like Jennifer's. They created online petitions. They put a lot of pressure on the Boy Scouts and essentially called them out for these policies that a lot of people had forgotten about. And in doing so, I think really hastened the process of changing these policies. Within a year of Scouts for Equality being founded, the policy banning gay youth had fallen. So it was very, very rapid that they were able to accomplish this. It's funny you say that because as I was reading the book, the book is is so detailed and it goes into such a long timeline that by the time I realized the actual overlay of uh, Scouts for Equality versus when that that policy changed, I, I couldn't believe it was only 365 days. I know. I know. And exactly that much time. Like they, the Boy Scouts have a national annual meeting every May. They were formed at one. And then by the next one, there was a vote happening to end the policy on gay youth. It really was incredible. And I, I make that point because the book is so detailed. You talk <laughs> you talk to so many people and you and you get their stories and it's almost a blow by blow of mm-hmm. meeting to meeting those two tentpole mm-hmm. moments um, and every little like 
agonizing sort of like, oh, defeat. We're going to we're going to organize. We're going to have an advocacy event at one of these meetings, but we're not going to be formally involved. But we don't want to threaten anybody. But we <laughs> you know, I encourage scouts to come that might be interested. And it's it's like a very and, and the PR campaign that's running side by side with it. I thought that was a really compelling part of the book because it was so detailed. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that. I was really lucky that the folks from Scouts for Equality and Change.org and GLAAD, who were some of the movement partners in this campaign, were incredibly generous with me. I mean, I but some of these people did like dozens of interviews, you know, got a, ha a hold of a lot of documents. And I wanted to paint it in that much detail because I thought it was important to show like what goes into a campaign like this, how you actually win a victory like this. I think there's a lot of lessons there for the current battles that we're fighting for LGBTQ people, but it was really fascinating for me and I wanted to try to include as much of that as I could. Like what you hear? Well, then it might be time to give us a flattering review. Reviews are the best way to make the magical podcast algorithm suggest our modest little podcast to other listeners. If you're feeling extra generous, please share this episode with a friend, family member, or that special person in your life. They'll thank you for it, and we will be forever in your debt. Troy Story, a podcast for the Collar City, streaming everywhere you get your podcasts. So let's go back to before the timeline of Scouts for Equality. The book starts much further back. You've, mm -hmm. you've alluded to that already. Some of the experiences of scouts in going back to the 70s can you sort of unpack what scouting was like that much mm -hmm. further back definitely the 1970s were a really weird and delicate time for the organization so the membership of the organization actually peaked in the early 70s so the boy scouts had been growing for a really long time especially post world war ii there was a huge boom in membership and then by the time the 70s came around, they were losing membership. They were sort of struggling to stay relevant. There were all these kind of strange attempts at bolstering the numbers. So at one point, they tried to involve girls in kind of like an auxiliary program. There was a lot of reworking of the handbook, which included this really infamous uh, piece of first aid advice about how to treat rat bites, which was aimed at kind of like urban like city dwellers, right? And a lot of these things were really heavily criticized. They were seen as like deviating from tradition. So the Boy Scouts was kind of unsure about like where to stand in this decade, essentially. But by the end of the decade, they seemed to make a choice, which was to throw their lot in with this growing conservative backlash to social progress. So the other thing about the 70s was it was a really great time actually for the gay rights movement kind of post stonewall in 1969 the gay rights movement was starting to notch a lot of victories half of the states in the country decriminalized uh, homosexuality they struck down these so-called sodomy laws in the 70s so there was a lot of good things happening for the community um, and then much like we're seeing today there was a big backlash to that there was a lot of protect our children rhetoric going around and so in 1978, the Boy Scouts threw their lot in with that side and said, we're going to formally ban gay men and gay youth from the organization. As much as the cultural context there explains that there's also a more specific story to what led to that policy. So there were two young boys in a small town in Minnesota. Uh, it's called Mankato. It's about an hour and a half outside Minneapolis. They were both named Scott and they were really involved in Scouts. And when they were 16 years old, they came out to each other. These two boys happened to be gay. And they were kind of delighted to know that they had found each other in this small town and actually didn't tell their scout leader. They just told their mom, one of their moms. And um, the mom actually reached out to the scout leader to say, hey, like, I'm worried for my sons. Can you help them? Uh, assuming that there would be some kind of mentorship that he could offer. And instead, what he did was revoke their membership. Um, so this became a bit of a news story as well. The two boys fought back against it. They held a press conference in town. The Associated Press actually attended that press conference, which made it a national story. And this is what really prompted the Boy Scouts to get involved. 
there was a question about whether the local leader's decision reflected national policy. And the Boy Scouts stepped in to say, yes, actually, we support this decision and issued a formal written policy for the very first time saying gay people are not allowed. So that's what was going on in the 70s. Right. And it's it's almost an accidental policy decision that comes from. Yes. This. It's forced upon them to say, OK, great. Now we have to take a hard position on this. Exactly. And that kind of sets off uh, that that domino effect, this series of cascading events, which for many kids and adults, it has a, a really harmful effect on their experience as kids, their experience as adult leaders with scouting sort of this organization that they've been involved with and then told because of who you are you are not permitted to be a member mm -hmm. just based on that exclusive criteria of being being gay or being queer yeah the really devastating thing to me about this is the lack of clarity around the policy actually because even though it was established in 1978 it really was not communicated even to membership never mind publicly like there were a series of news stories about this Minnesota incident. And the Boy Scouts at that point just said, yes, we support the local leader. But about a month later, when they actually issue a formal policy document, it only goes to scout executives. It does not go to the membership at large. And so there was no way of knowing for a lot of people that this was the official stance. And it only started to enter the public consciousness in the early 80s when the first legal challenge to the policy emerged. But even then, you had to be sort of paying attention to the news. And most kids, when they join scouting, are, you know, five, six years old in Cub Scouts. They're, one, not reading the news, probably, and two, might not even have a conception of their own sexuality at that point. So it was really easy and really common for kids to join scouting, maybe realize later that they were gay, and then be like, oh, wait, that's a problem? You know, it was really just not communicated. It was not in the handbook. It was not in the membership application. So that happens so often. The lessons that I learned in Scouts, similar to the values of, you know, a lot of people may get through religion or family, was always one of acceptance and, and service and community. And so it's what makes me so frustrated when I was reading the book to see how an organization that I loved and that I valued so much being a member of and my experience in for 12, 13, 14 years um, made me so so frustrated uh, to see an organization, again, espou who espouses those values work to actively exclude others. And that childhood is already so fraught with insecurity. Mm -hmm. And then you add this additional layer of exclusion after you, you find a group, you find some place you could call home like scouts and then to feel pushed out. I, I must I must have been crushing for for those. It really was. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, so many queer people found a home in scouting, myself included. And I think that's because of what you said. It does have this accepting ethos. And, you know, scouting can be pretty masculine at times still. Um, I'm not saying it's this, you know, like pride flag waving activity all the time. But but still, it was often maybe safer than school or sports for a lot of queer kids. And so, yeah, they found this home and it was incredibly heartbreaking and crushing to then find out later the organization didn't want you there, actually. Um, so there was this dichotomy between like the local experience that kids had in their troop, which a lot of times was accepting, um, and then the national policy, which then would come in and yeah, kick someone out or just kind of completely ruin that experience. So it was just a really hard hard time for a lot of those queer kids. Just earlier in this interview, you, you alluded to the fact that you were not really aware of the policy that was in place. And you're younger than me. Yeah. <laughs> you got your Eagle Scout after I did. And when I was revisiting it, I was attempting to recollect that time in scouting and what I remember my only re recollection was, I believe I wrote an email to the scouts when they were soliciting. Mm from members saying, do you or do you not uh, uh, oppose uh, the inclusion of gay scouts? Mm -hmm. And I remember writing saying, this is so silly. Like, just <laughs> just, just include everything. <laughs> what year that was, I, I don't remember. Yeah. But this book 
does such a great job at concisely compiling in like very, very uh, concise detail, exactly like blow for blow that happened. And it is sort of a forgotten story in a way now that, I mean, just the, the Boy Scouts of America just recently were recording this at the end of May, May 26th, just last week, I believe, announced that they're changing their name. So a lot of that history tends to get lost in the recent or even distant past. Can mm -hmm. can you dive a little bit deeper into the things that happened prior to the establishment of Scouts for Equality, like the, the court cases that happened? I mean, this was not something that was just decided instantaneously. Definitely. This was a, an evolved process over years yes. and years. Yeah, yeah, I would love to. And I will say my scouting experience lived almost perfectly in like this gap between some of the major moments. And so I'll, I'll situate that in a second. But the battle really started in 1981. So just a few years after the policy was created and a scout named Tim Curran in the San Francisco Bay area, again, kind of stumbled upon it, right? He had become an Eagle Scout, found scouting to be this kind of refuge as was so common and was pretty out as a gay kid. He actually took a male date to prom, was one of the first kids in the country to ever do that. And then I think as a freshman in college, decided he wanted to volunteer at a national scouting event and he submitted his application. And at first he was rejected for this kind of simple reason of paperwork. He wasn't actually registered as an adult volunteer properly. So he thinks, okay, I'll just sort this out. And when he tries to do that, the council says, actually, don't bother. We wouldn't let you be an adult volunteer anyway. And this was because they had recently found out he was gay. Uh, Tim Curran had participated in this newspaper series about local gay people, essentially. And they knew this about him. So they said, we can't accept you due to this national policy. This was, again, a surprise. He didn't know that this policy was in place. And he decided to fight back against it. So he became the first legal challenger. He sued the Boy Scouts in 1981. His court case would end up lasting almost two decades, which is hard to wrap your head around. But there were a lot of delays. There were a lot of phases. Uh, suffice it to say, it always remained in California. It actually ended in the California Supreme Court when he lost. Uh, the California Supreme Court found that the scouting organization um, did not fall under this civil rights law in the state that only applied to public accommodations. So that's in 1998, Tim Curran loses after almost two decades fighting this. But in the meantime, there's another big legal challenge that emerges. So in the early 90s, we have someone named James Dale. James is maybe the name that a lot of listeners will recognize. He was the one that I actually started reporting the book with because that's what I recognize. <laughs> so James Dale grew up in New Jersey, actually in the same hometown as me, which is kind of a fun coincidence. And in the early 90s, he was a, a college student who was trying to volunteer. He had become an Eagle Scout. He was still really interested in the program. And he, too, uh, found this barrier where the council said, no, you can't be a volunteer because you're gay. He also sues the Boy Scouts. He actually has a lot more success in state court. James Dale manages to win a unanimous victory in the New Jersey Supreme Court, which is extremely validating. It was actually the biggest legal win yet against the Boy Scouts uh, for this issue. And he actually ends up at the Supreme Court of the United States in the year 2000. And some people were actually unhappy that he ended up there, including his own lawyer, because they felt it would have been better to leave the victory in state court and they were quite worried about what would happen at the Supreme Court. And turns out rightfully so, James Dale ended up losing in a 5-4 decision in the Supreme Court in June of 2000. And that kind of marked the end of this first wave of activism of legal challenges. Everyone sort of felt if we lost at the Supreme Court, there's not a whole lot else we can do here. Because the Supreme Court essentially said, as a private organization, the Boy Scouts have a freedom of association constitutional right to choose their own members. And so that marked the beginning of a lull. And this was coincidentally the same year that I joined scouting as a Cub Scout. And so it lay dormant really until 2011, when I mentioned earlier, this uh, story about Jennifer Terrell popped up. 2011's year, I became an Eagle Scout. So I almost perfectly lived in this gap where 
I didn't know about the policy because it wasn't in the news and no one was really fighting it during that period. So that's the broad overview of kind of the free scouts for equality timeline. Can you explain the crux of the arguments made before the Supreme Court, both for and against ending or upholding the current, yeah. say, policy? Yeah. So there were two big pieces that animated pretty much all of these legal cases. One of them was whether the Boy Scouts could be considered a public accommodation. This was really key in the state court battles because the civil rights protections for gay people often hinged on this, that if you were a public accommodation, you could not discriminate. But if you were, say, a private organization, maybe you could. Um, and the Boy Scouts existed in kind of this gray area because they are actually a private organization, um, but they function with a deep level of public support. They are uh, like chartered essentially by Congress. They have all these federal uh, benefits from the army among other agencies at the state level they had all these benefits uh, they host a lot of meetings in civic locations like schools or firehouses or police stations so the lawyers for james dale and tim current for example would argue that this public character of the boy scouts was really undeniable even though they may have been quote unquote private in addition to that the boy scouts solicited the public at large. You know, they really were not an exclusive organization. Their stated goal was to attract every boy into the program. They wanted everyone to be a scout. So many of the judges agreed with that and said, yeah, actually, this functions as a public accommodation, even if it is technically a private organization. So that was one piece of the argument being made. The other piece of it was this kind of like, um, <laughs> this part about like whether the organization has a right to choose its own members. And there was often a comparison being made to churches. Um, so it was sort of like, well, if the Catholic Church can say, we only want Catholics, then the Boy Scouts should be able to say, we only want people who align with our moral values. And they saw this idea of being morally straight, which is a part of the Scout Oath, to mean literally straight, to mean heterosexual. And so they were like, that's really key to what we do. That has been something we've been saying for 100 years. We think that we should be able to choose our membership based on the adherence to that to that value. Um, and the lawyers for James Dale and Tim Curran said, actually, that's not what it, that's not what morally straight means. You, that's not how it's explained in the handbook. That's really not the way that most scouts understand it. And so that's actually not your purpose. Like the Boy Scouts doesn't exist to breed generations of straight people. You know, it exists for all sorts of other reasons. Um, and so it's not central enough to the organization, this exclusion of gay people, to justify a carve out from civil rights protections. How do you have such meticulous recreations of the various court proceedings in the book? Were you using transcripts? Yes, yeah. So I'm, the Supreme Court was really easy. You can actually listen to an audio recording, even as far back as 2008, recorded and published audio of the entire arguments. So I, I had that in addition to the transcript. For some of the earlier ones, it was a bit harder, but I did get transcripts as well. So for James Dale's case in New Jersey, uh, I went to my hometown and went to the county courthouse and, and tried to shake loose that paperwork. It ended up coming from a state archive uh, as a like giant digitized microfilm like PDF, which was kind of fun. Um, and then... For Tim Curran, in his case in California, I actually went to his apartment in New York City and he had just boxes and boxes of court transcripts and everything I could possibly need. In a way, the the book is very much uh, living history in a way. You are you are documenting something, like you just said, tracking down the, the recordings of the Supreme Court uh, deliberations over this topic, which I think is really what makes this book, to me, very special as an Eagle Scout. I mm -hmm. found really compelling, but also I think would be interesting for the average person who might be curious about this particular part of American history, legal history, LGBTQ mm -hmm. history. Um, and, and that's why I find it, I found the book so enjoyable because it checked a lot of different boxes for me that I found really interesting. Yeah. I'm so glad you said that. I wanted the book to be something that anyone could pick up. I think Certainly, I know a lot of scouting people who are very excited about it. 
But yeah, this is an overlooked piece, I think, of American history, of, of gay history. As you said, these court cases had a huge impact on how people thought about the queer community, about legal thought even. There's an entire book about the Dale case, essentially, that talks about the implications for freedom of association in a legal sense. An entire book about just that because it had such an impact. So there really are so many different ways to be drawn to the story. I think it has so much for so many different audiences. Got a question? Have a suggestion? We want to hear from you. Drop us a line at mail at troystorypod.com. You can always find us on social media, including YouTube, Instagram, Threads, Facebook, TikTok, and even the digital wasteland known as X, formerly Twitter. My next question, the outcome of the Supreme Court decision and the impact on scouting and, as you just said, the, the public at large, legal precedents, worries about membership decline, those who say ah, this, the scouts have decided to exclude queer, gay, LGBTQ scouts and scout leaders. I'm going to withdraw my children, uh, loss of financial report, uh, so financial support, which comes sort of later on in the book, and then just generally disillusionment about uh, the organization. It's detailed in in, uh, in great specificity in the book. Are th is there some specific example that you could point out in that sort of grouping of ideas? Definitely. Yeah, a lot of people saw the Supreme Court victory as a hollow victory in many respects, because almost immediately there was a kind of cultural backlash to the Boy Scouts. So like you said, there was financial implications. There were several large corporations who were like, wait, we have these inclusionary policies at a corporate level. We can no longer support the Boy Scouts. There were some chapters of the United Way that pulled out funding. But then there were also these really interesting battles happening on a local level where some schools or civic organizations said, wait, we can no longer sponsor a scout troop because their policy recently cemented by the Supreme Court goes against our beliefs. And what was really interesting here is that the Boy Scouts always said, our values are not for sale. They said, if you don't like our exclusion of gay people, fine, you can leave. But then after the Supreme Court, when people started leaving for that very reason, they actually went to court at many times at the local level to stop that from happening. They tried to like legally block schools and other organizations from dropping the scouts on this basis. So they said they didn't care, but they really actually did because I think they saw that it had this really significant impact on the perception of the scouts. Um, I don't want to overestimate it. Like it was, you know, isolated in some pockets for sure, mostly in major cities, but it was very real to the point where the Boy Scouts got worried about it. The book has a big emphasis on the internet and organizing online and the impact it had on the success of the movement to get the scouting organization to change its mind, specifically online petitions at change.org. Can you sort of explain the component of that story and how the internet, the, the role of the internet and what it played in this movement? Absolutely. It really was timed well in a way. No one planned for Jennifer Terrell to be kicked out of her Cub Scout den in 2011, but it was a time when online organizing was kind of at its peak. Change.org, which you mentioned, is still around. It's still an online petition platform. I don't think it has quite the same cultural place as it did 10 years ago. Uh, it had a lot of power back then. And People, I think, were really eager on social media at that point. It was a, a less toxic place, I'd like to think, to, yeah, support a cause, to rally behind something. And so what happened time and time again is when Scouts for Equality would pick up on a story, whether it was Jennifer Terrell or Ryan Dreesen or Pascal Tessier, um, they would start these petitions and sometimes overnight would see like hundreds of thousands of signatures flow in. And everyone was surprised by this. Even the folks at change.org were like, whoa, we've never seen something like this. That's actually what gave a lot of these organizations the confidence to fight this battle at all. There was a moment around Jennifer Terrell's petition. Again, she was the first one where people were unsure whether there was really a battle to be fought here. Again, the Supreme Court had already given the Boy Scouts that victory. 
But because the petitions took off so quickly and because a lot of the supporters were actually scouters themselves, there was this moment of like, oh, wait, this does actually have a lot of power. So the petitions became a kind of backbone of the campaign. The Boy Scouts never really accepted the petitions. They they often would travel to Boy Scout headquarters in Dallas, drop off boxes and boxes of printed signatures, and they never were accepted in any tangible way. But I do think that the sort of like public outrage that was generated on social media and online really went a long way because every time this got back in the news, there was like a fresh outrage cycle against the Boy Scouts. Maybe that happened to an extent in the 80s and 90s. There was a lot of press coverage around it, but I think it probably reached a lot farther in the social media age than it ever had before. Part of that activism and and signing of the petitions is often tied into, during the timeline, is often tied into meetings of the Boy Scout yeah. the BSA national level leadership where they would show, you know, organizers would show up at meetings, Scouts for Equality would show up at meetings with a a scout who is sort of serving as a spokesperson, de facto spokesperson for the group and say, we are bringing 50,000 signatures here to get you to do this. And the book through that process sort of explains the administrative mechanisms of the BSA and the mm -hmm. of how they were deciding on whether to maintain a policy or change it. It's fascinating to see that leverage be used and how the outgrowth of the internet lit a fire under that that movement. And it was literally just people signing a petition online, but it, it carried so much, so much weight. Can you kind of dive into that a little bit and specifically mm -hmm. what those types of meetings were that Scouts for Equality was was trying to influence? Yeah, definitely. So the meetings that were often part of the campaign were called national annual meetings. So they're not the only national gatherings that the BSA has every year. There's also an executive board that meets privately. But the national annual meeting is unique because it actually draws people from all over the country. So each Boy Scout council, there's about 300 of them, sends delegates, essentially. It kind of works like the House of Representatives. It's really interesting. They Each council gets like a set number plus additional based on their population. Um, and so... It ends up being a few thousand people who attend this national annual meeting every year. And it's kind of like a scouting bonanza. It happens at these hugely ostentatious resorts. There's like meetings and expos and all kinds of stuff. But at the end of it, there's also this meeting where everybody votes on various policies or program issues. And normally these votes are really inconsequential. It's sort of like the executive board makes all the decisions ahead of time and then the the full national council, these, you know, 3000 people from all over the country, they just kind of rubber stamp mostly what's going to happen anyway. But Scouts for Equality and actually activists even before that often saw this as an opportunity to pressure the Boy Scouts or again, at least to create a news cycle. And what was unique about the 2013 meeting was they actually managed to put this to a vote. So in 2012, that's when Scouts for Equality was kind of formed. They were just picketing outside the meeting, essentially. By 2013, they had put enough pressure on the organization that BSA leadership itself said, the only way to solve this problem is kind of democratically. And this is the only time before or since that this has happened, where the Boy Scouts actually hired an, a third party voting firm that, that, you, that used to do like union elections and brought them into this huge resort in Texas and said, okay, all the voting members, a couple thousand people here, are going to fill out a ballot. It's almost identical to how you'd vote in any election. And we're going to count up the ballots. And however this goes, that will be our policy on gay youth. The question was simply, should we allow gay youth or not? And about 62% of the voters approved it, said we should allow gay youth, which was a hugely monumental moment and just such an incredible one that it was put up to a vote like this. I think the leadership felt like that was the only way to kind of build confidence in the decision was if it came from the ground up, so to speak, rather than if it was a decision from the top. Because even if they had changed the policy in the same way from the top, I think there would have been backlash in a different sense. So it was, yeah, the in administrative machinations of that meeting were really cool and unique. And detailed in how the information <laughs> was then reported back out of the meetings, the initial decision, yes. the heartbreak, 
the emails, the text messages, and then later on, the the YouTube live streams where advocates were all together waiting for the results of uh, all of these different uh, subsequent votes, which I, I found mm -hmm. really compelling. There is a companion piece to the book, your podcast, Morally Straight, which is obviously the same name as the book. What inspired you to do it? Obviously, it ha it has a promotional component, but it's it's clearly uh, much more than that. You can tell mm -hmm. listening to it. Yeah. So the podcast grew out of my newsletter by the same name. And the newsletter has actually been around for about four years now. So I started it really early on when I was kind of starting to report the book. I wasn't sure exactly where it would go, but I just wanted to build up an audience for it. And I also felt like there were stories I wanted to tell that I often struggled to pitch or find a home for as a freelance journalist. So the newsletter was really this community mostly of other scouting volunteers who were really hungry for information about what's going on, how do I create an inclusive scout troop, all these really tactical questions, basically. And so I've been writing that weekly for almost four years now. And about a year ago, I decided to add a podcast component because I really wanted to highlight some of the stories that had come out of my book. Every single person, I think, who's been on the podcast was is also in the book. And so I wanted to give these summaries of their stories. These were all really important people, some of whom were not quite as famous, who maybe didn't have a spotlight on them at all previously. And I just thought, you know, this is a good taste of what's coming. You're right, it does have a bit of a promotional component, but I just thought it was important to give those stories a place to live, even if someone never reads the book. Part one of our chat with Mike DeSocio comes to a close, but part two is just around the corner. We take a closer look at Mike's personal history with the Boy Scouts, his Eagle Scout project, how he began his career in journalism, and where he sees the future of scouting in America following the most recent developments in the Boy Scouts' evolution as a youth organization to embrace inclusion. Even in the scouting context, like the vast majority of people I encounter are really happy and excited about LGBTQ inclusion. The challenges are more around like, how do we do it? And like, how do we make kids feel welcome? And there's seemingly a lot less conversation about like, should we do it? As always, don't forget to hit that subscribe button on whatever streaming service you're using to ensure you get notified about upcoming chapters of Troy Story, a podcast for the Collar City. You can also visit TroyStoryPod.com to get signed up for email updates and check out previous episodes. Until next time, love yourself, love one another, and may Pod save Troy. Troy Story, a podcast for the Collar City, is hosted, written, edited, and produced by me, John Salka. Our theme music is by Stephen J. Goldman at Four Legs Records. Like what you heard? Please give us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to Troy Story, a podcast for the Collar City. This is incredibly helpful for getting others to find our show. Want to know more? Visit TroyStoryPod.com to see upcoming episodes, guests, and bonus content. Thanks for listening. The views or opinions expressed by guests are their own and not of the host or a Troy Story, a podcast for the Collar City.